With the sound of that bowl, we affirm at this time when the news is so difficult in our local areas and in this whole world, we affirm our collective hope for peace. We also affirm that these lands that we love are the ancestral lands of the Yavapai people, the Wipukepas, the Kwevkepayas, the Tolkepayas, and the Yavapai. During the past month, I have been studying the migration of birds. To begin, I want you to watch a video of a man. He's a French scientist who is kind of a migrating bird herder. Um, you can look him up, but he's, he is helping the birds. The first time I saw it, I thought, if you don't know he's helping the birds, it looks strange. <laughs> but he is working with the birds and it just gives you an idea he, because he's up with them you i want you to get the sense of what it might be to be able to migrate through the sky good morning <coughs> welcome to granite peak unitarian universalist congregation in prescott arizona and as your worship associate today, I want to welcome all of you. It is uplifting to see all of you in person and online. I hope you're ready to enjoy our special gathering today to celebrate the mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, amphibians, anthropods, and I better stop there as I'm beginning to itch. Yeah, our house pets are currently desert giant centipedes, so we don't kill them, but we remove them. <laughs> so let us now move on to the mission statement of our congregation. Please join me. <clears throat> we are a compassionate spiritual community that celebrates diversity, nurtures the personal and spiritual growth of all ages, shares our gifts, promotes justice for all, and serves the world we live in. After our service, we hope all who are present will join us for coffee and socializing in Davis Hall. And Zoomers, please join the breakout rooms for a stimulating conversation. And of course, your pet can sit on your lap. If you are joining us for the first time, please check out our website at prescottuu.org Prescott for more information about us. If here in person, we encourage you to introduce yourself at the end of the service. Please stay and chat with a member or two. We thank our pianist, Lena Hewen, our choir director, Mary Lou Prince, and our choir, and all our Sunday morning volunteers, of course. Please take a moment to set your phones on worship mode. Announcements. In addition to the announcements that we're showing on the screen before the service, you can read about things happening at GPUU in the weekly newsletter, on our website, and in Reverend Patty's videos. We also have some printed copies of announcements at the welcome table for you. I have one announcement that there will be an OWL meeting after coffee this morning. Let me see. Yeah, there you are, Robert. Thank you. So don't forget, if you'd like to find out more about the OWL program, please meet after the coffee. Sandra Palacios, and of course, um, let's see, what's her name? Um, anyway, Sandra Palacios, our faith development coordinator is teaching ages five and older across the street at our faith development building. 
and they also have preschoolers frequently visiting them as well. So they're doing projects together, which is a new development as of a few months ago. If a congregant has an announcement, you should give it to the WA before the service. And if it's long, the worship associate will abbreviate it. So just a future information. begin our service in the Unitarian Universalist tradition of lighting the chalice. And our chalice lighter this morning is B. Senna. Today we light the chalice with a quote by Linda Lyanda Lynn Hopp, award-winning author, naturalist, eco-philosopher, and speaker. Birds will give you a window if you allow them. They will show you secrets of another world, fresh visions that, though it is avian, can accompany you home and after and alter your life. They will do this for you even if you don't know their names. Though such knowing is a thoughtful gesture, they will do this for you if you watch them. We like this chalice as a symbol of our heritage and gratitude for this beloved community. Good morning, everyone. I am happy to be here, and I apologize for the confusion of having one dog, one dog present, and we have a few photographs. It was not sufficiently advertised, although I did try, and it was advertised in two different ways, one with dogs present, one with photographs present. So I am just thankful that all of you are here. I want to open this morning with the words that inspired this service. Terry Tempest Williams' prayer to birds. She wrote, I pray to birds because I believe they will carry messages of my heart upward. I pray to them because I believe that their existence the way the song begins and ends today, the invocations and the benediction of birds. I pray to the birds because they remind me of what I love rather than what I fear. On this day, we celebrate birds. We also celebrate all animals. The many, many ones who bless our lives. Louie, I want you to say the names of all of those animals who bless your lives. She went big for us. Oscar, Angel, Henry. They are, they are many, and as, and as some people will call, will call me the ancestors, I'm calling, I'm calling in all of those, those beloved animals to be with us, with us today, today on those, those empty, empty chairs. chairs. Let, us, Let us rise in body, body or spirit and sing together. together. Hymn, Hymn number 203, two, three, all, all creatures of our earth and sky. sky. 
a son and daughter in their 20s who are facing a very serious health crisis. We hold Kyle and Allison Dalton. And we hold Brad Parsons, who's recovering from eye surgery. And we send him all of our hopes and prayers for a full recovery. We hold in joy someone we held last week who was in a bomb shelter in Jerusalem. She is now home. Tom Burrow's friend's granddaughter was able to find a flight to Los Angeles and she is now safe. But we continue to hold all those in Gaza and Israel and those surrounding lands who are suffering from the violence of the past days. Please enter with me into a spirit of meditation and we will hear some music during this time and I invite you to come. I have kept the candles. We had a vigil here for those in Gaza and Israel. We had a vigil on Tuesday and those candles are for that interfaith hope for peace. But I invite you to put your stones for your animals, for the birds, and for the humans you hold dear on this earth.
As we <clears throat> prepare to take the offering, let us recognize the feeling of community and relationships that we have established with one another as we gather each week. This congregation, its programs are supported by your generosity. We also give back to the greater community through our Seeds of Support program. And this month's recipient is the Granite Dells Preservation Foundation. So please read the OOS blurb for the SOS. Oops, sorry. To give online, the link is available. Actually, this week, oh. it, just this week, just this week, okay. it is the United Animal Friends oh. um, because it's the blessing of the animals. So that's why you didn't know it's fine. Oh, I should have said to you. It's okay. <laughs> We're supposed to keep this short, but. <laughs> so anyway, um, to give online, it's avail uh, the link is available in the chat, or you can also go on the website. Now, enjoy our offertory music, Blackbird, by Paul McCartney and John Lennon, performed by Lena Huben. the generosity of spirit expressed through this offering today and what is given in love is received in gratitude blessed be reading today was written by Karen Greenberg who is here with her little dog Ceres. If you are human you need a friend who isn't. Yapping, licking, running like the rain, flying like the earth, breathing fire on cold winter nights, digging for the roots of it all fueled by love, by elation, by grace, a flower in the bouquet of chaotic spirits, playing for joy, not victory, sleeping to jump in night's transcending tired limbs. Thank you, Karen. We read that poem in our animal blessing three years ago when we were in the middle of a pandemic isolated from each other. I was sitting in my living room with, I think Louie was 
sitting on my lap. And our animals were so happy to have us full time in their lives. And we were thrilled to have them with us. I love our dog, Louie. And he continues to occupy the same big place in my heart. And this year, my attention has expanded up into the trees and the skies, as I know that many of yours have, into the realm of birds. I've always noticed birds, and at times they have been a major part of my life. Like when we learned about the Siberian swans that came to the winter, came in the winter to a coastal area only an hour from our house in Japan, all the way from Siberia. But it wasn't until I met Etienne on my pilgrimage this summer that their songs became a part of my daily life. Etienne and I had the same rhythm. We walked at the same pace. That meant that periodically we would be walking side by side. It just happened naturally. It was a very interesting thing about the pilgrimage. And in our first conversation, he told me, this was about three days into the pilgrimage. He told me he had been counting the insects as he walked along. And after three days of walking, he had only encountered one slug and no bees at all. And he didn't hear any birds in the forest. The birds have nothing to eat around here, he said. That's why there are no birds. I had heard about the crisis of birds on this planet, but as I walked, I had also seen many slugs because I was always looking down to avoid falling. And I had seen quite a few bees because I always stopped at rose bushes to check for a scent. And they almost always had an amazing scent. So the next morning, I turned on my Merlin app and I began listening for birds and identifying them through that amazing app. The forests were full of birds, common chiffchaffs, chaffinches, and black redcaps. Once I forgot to turn off the recording and in an hour, eight kinds of birds were recorded in the surrounding trees. And when I walked with Etienne again, again, because it did happen, I made him listen to the birds because I had the recordings in my phone. And I'm not sure he was convinced. And the truth is that the birds of this world are in trouble. He was right in that way, they are in trouble. And perhaps that has always been a part of our relationship with birds. They are so fragile. And we are so large and clumsy in comparison with them. As a child, did you ever find a baby bird fallen from a nest? My siblings and I did and we tried to keep it alive, but it didn't work. Did anybody have any luck with that? No. Oh, we have one person who did. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. So for all of the mystery and for the fragility of birds and our hope for their safety and well-being, the Granite Peak singers right now are going to sing Wind in the Desert. Thank you. 
I just look at that tree and listen. For centuries, people have been fascinated by the passage of birds that come and stay in ponds near their homes or occupy the bird house in their garden. Although the image for me of migration has been the Canada geese that I experienced in Wisconsin that would fly overhead. overhead. Their honking was a sign. Autumn was moving into winter. That was my image of vibration. And this book that I read, actually two books I read, opened my eyes to the billions of birds that migrate in the darkness while we are sleeping 
creating a great mystery of where they were headed. In the 17th century, scientist Dr. Charles Morton, who's well known for writing a physics textbook, so he was no kook, he also published a treatise on his theory of migration. The birds were simply flying to the moon. Migration was cloaked in mystery. Scientists had to tune their senses in the darkness to try to understand what was happening out of their sight. On the evening of September 14, 1896, historian and amateur ornithologist Oren Libby climbed a hill west of Madison, Wisconsin in a chill wind. The wind was loud, but over the course of five hours, Libby counted 3,800 bird calls, an average of 12 per minute. Can you imagine keeping that up? This is what he wrote. I love these words. The air seemed at times fairly alive with invisible birds as the calls rang out. Now sharply and near at hand, and now faintly and far away. Almost human, many of them seemed too, and it was not difficult to imagine that they expressed a whole range of emotions from anxiety and fear up to good fellowship and joy. It was a marvel and a, and a mystery enacted under the cover of night and of which only fugitive tidings reached the listeners below. In contrast to those bird calls that I identify with the Merlin apps during Merlin app during the daylight, the calls of migrating birds are both different from their usual calls. They are also very different from each other. There is not just one migrating call. And it was only much later with the development of recording technology that scientists were finally able to distinguish one from another, except in the most broadest sweeps of birds, because sometimes there were thousands of birds all moving together in the dark sky. And then at the turn of the 20th century, a quirky technique emerged for identifying birds migrating in the darkness. This involved observing birds flying across the disk of the full moon. Can you imagine? Have you, I mean, I've seen photographs of birds in front of the moon, but wow. So in the 1950s, scientists at Louisiana State University, at their Museum of Zoology, there were these two men, Lowry and Newman. They recruited 2,500 volunteers in 325 locations from Canada to Panama to watch the moon. They also wrote up a how-to pamphlet for observers to make sure that the data that they collected was as reliable as possible, complete with advice, because you can imagine what it would be like to be looking up. So they had advice on how to arrange the pillow behind your neck and how to get an adjustable lawn chair to stay comfortable while gazing at the moon for long periods recording all the birds who crossed through that light. In Audubon magazine, Lowry was quoted saying that flight studies by means of the moon would permit us to peer into the very heart of age old basic mysteries of mass migration. 
And then there was the development of recording technology that sent budding scientists like Bill Evans on a life adventure. One night when he was a university student camped on a bluff overlooking a river in Afton State Park near Minneapolis, he was hoping to get an early start on the next morning and he wasn't expecting to find his life calling. But that's what happened. Lying awake in his tent, he suddenly realized he was hearing the calls of migrating birds passing overhead in the darkness. In an hour, he counted a hundred cuckoos, following each one, each one with his ears as its gurgling trills approached from the south and then dwindled toward the north. And only a year and a half later, Bill Evans left his life and he started a new one following weather fronts back and forth across the country, recording migration, trying to piece together the identifications of those birds whose calls he captured and picking up odd jobs in pizza parlors to support himself. And when he thinks of that time, he remembers the sheer enjoyment of sitting up on a hilltop, cracking a beer, and listening to those flights. It made him feel, he said, in tune with the whole planet. No matter where you are, no matter where you are, he said, if you can tune in to this river of birds going over in migration, it connects you. Your mind expands. So what do we learn from all of this? As I have been reading first about how this great mystery of migration was solved piece by piece by scientists who were impassioned with furthering their research, often writing quite romantically about the birds they studied. I have been amazed by the perseverance of scientists and also the moments of sheer joy. I have been impressed by the love they put into that work, even though they would not write that word in one of their research papers. They loved those birds. I have also been impressed by the way they work together. Scientists at the University of Illinois and the LSU Museum made friends with scientists in Colombia and Africa. And this study of migration brought scientists from the Netherlands, the UK, Australia, the US, and China to the mudflats of the Yellow Sea that is a bottleneck where almost all the shorebirds of the wor world gather to feed at some time. And they gathered to talk about, to try to understand that millions of shorebirds were being affected by the development. And their understanding helped them put out a call that stopped development the Chinese government actually stopped what they were doing. These scientists gave me hope. Young climate activist Vanessa Nakate from Uganda teaches us this. It's not the devastation that keeps us fighting. It's what we see in our minds, the vision, the hope. Because if there's no hope, what are we going to look forward to? On my pilgrimage, I found hope by tuning my ears to the sound of birds. These scientists, aware of the increased danger facing birds, continue to pay attention and they are discovering more and more ways that birds are adapting, and they are pinpointing those places on the earth that are essential for the survival of those birds. 
Instead of entering a bunker, they are reaching across the earth and creating relationships. The swans that visited our coastal flats in Japan during the winter depended on the tundra of Siberia for their nesting. We knew a man who followed them, who went to their nesting grounds and followed them all the way to where we lived. And then he followed them in his little red car up the coast of Japan. And one day when we went out to see them, we heard the story from someone that when they flew off to go to their next place, they turned to him and they bowed. I believe that birds embody our interdependence, our fragility, our dependence on one another. When you sit outside in the early morning or evening or open the window nearest your bed, what do you hear? And as you sleep, what birds are flying overhead? Where are they going? Where are they coming from? In the famous story of the Good Samaritan, Rabbi Jesus urges us to expand our sense of who is our neighbor. Could we expand ourselves, our sense of who is our neighbor, even beyond humans, to the birds? Where do they nest? Where do they fly? What could we do? As Bill Evans, their presence could make us in tune, could put us in tune with the whole planet. No matter where you are, if you can tune in to this river of birds going over in migration, it connects you, your mind expands. The Quad City area and the world needs expanded minds. And there are practical steps, like putting bird deterrent window markers on your windows, planting native plants. Don't let your cats out at night. And especially to turn out your lights, especially between dawn and dusk, and find and between dusk and dawn, sorry. Yes, that would be <laughs> between dusk and dawn. And find out from people who are concentrating on birds in this area, what affects the birds here? I hope, it is my hope that we each explore our connections our reciprocity with these beings that delight us with their songs, that imbue us with prayerfulness, and sometimes fly thousands and thousands of miles without stopping. We are blessed by their presence in our woodlands and sky. When we protect them, we are protecting ourselves. That was brought out a number of times in these books. May we each find the thread that connects us to them and hold to it and pray. I pray to the birds because they remind me of what I love rather than what I fear. Amen, and may it be so. And now I invite you to rise in body or spirit. And before you sing, we're going to listen to Lena play this song. It's a, you might know, not know this song, but is it is a familiar melody and its words are perfect. So let's listen to her play through it once.
Many birders out there. How many of you think of yourself as themselves as birders? We have a few. So I am inviting all of you to join the ranks of birders. I am inviting all of you anew to tune yourselves to these fragile visitors. Except for the woodpecker who's pecking on our house now. Doesn't seem so fragile. But I invite you into seeing birds in a new way and listening for them when you are walking, especially if something in your life is annoying you, that bird will sweep that thing away. Listen for the sound of those birds. Amen, and may it be so. And now we will extinguish our chalice so that our people on Zoom can go into their breakout rooms. And I see Drew is there, and Karen and Steve. Oh, and Tony. Anyway, wonderful that all of you are here with us as well. Thank you. And now let us say this extinguishing the chalice words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you. And I, there is, there are beverages, um, coffee for those of you that find that exciting. Um,